live stream hopefully you can all see what's going on here I'm trying to make sure that uh, get a good look at the incubator as I put it together but first before I get to any of that I would like to welcome you all and I have a question for a question from Jordan Safala one of our patreon backers who uh, posted a question on patreon and I wanted to to get into that and make sure he got an answer so here we go. Jordan says, I had a question about a bioactive setup. I wanted to add a live plant to my chameleon's enclosure. I just wanted to see if you would recommend just placing the pot into the substrate I have, or would you take the plant out of the pot and try to plant it into the substrate? And for me, uh, it depended a lot on the different type of substrate. I asked if he was going full bioactive with an ABG style substrate, and then I would say, yes, bare root the plant and plant it without the substrate, or if you're going with a simpler substrate like coconut fiber I would recommend keeping it in the pot and then he asked uh, he wasn't sure exactly what I meant by ABG so I decided to give him a, a full answer on that so ABG stands for Atlanta Botanical Gardens and it's a very light substrate mix it's kind of intended to make sure oxygen can and water can travel through it very freely so it has things like sphagnum moss and tree fern fiber and charcoal and orchid bark and stuff like that in it there are a lot of companies that produce it now Atlanta Botanical Gardens was kind of the pioneer with it, but I get mine usually from neherpeticulture.com. There are a lot of other companies that sell it, Josh's Frogs, The Bio Dude, lots of others. So um, it specifically is intended to maintain humidity while allowing water and air to travel through it freely. Keeps the substrate from compacting and starting to, to rot into a soggy mess like a lot of other substrates would in high humidity over time. So hopefully that helps. Jordan, thank you for your question and thank you for everything you do as a Patreon backer. Love it. All right, so let me see. I'm gonna catch up here with the chat a little bit. We've got Goatee Guy, Moultrie Geeks, Captain Obvious, hello, the Backwoods Serpentarium, Liam, Heather Jensen, Make It Kate, Jay's Crazy Obsessions, Charles Deliveris, um, cool, and Crystal, Pets and plants, awesome. And Mr. Snake, do you think you can keep stag beetles with millipedes and cockroaches? Good question. I'm not sure. My first reaction would be to keep them separately just for safety because uh, some might prey upon the others. You know, with if, are you talking about adult stag beetles or are you trying to raise larvae? Because adult stag beetles might not be in as precarious a position as the larvae would be in that case. But... That would be my first instinct. Thomas, hello. So, make it Kate. Thank you for the suggestion to make a video on the setup of the, the uh, incubator. I have been looking into this, kind of reading over the instructions. I've never assembled an incubator before, so uh, I wanted to make sure I kind of got a, a general idea of how to do it before I went too far. And I think that was a great idea. So, let's get into it. And I will periodically check in on the chat. Uh, so, the first step here, got to be careful with it because this incubator is essentially just a styrofoam box with a heating element and a thermostat. I mean, it's not super fragile, but I got to be careful. So it came with some other things too, as you can see here. I haven't messed with it a whole lot, just kind of read through the instructions. So it's got the thermometer in here and it came with the hygrometer too. So I can uh, measure the humidity. I just um, installed the battery a minute ago, right before here. So first step is to put the liner in on the bottom. There we go. Get the liner in there. And then the next step, I believe, is to install the humidity uh, troughs. Okay. So the humidity troughs, I need to pay attention to where the, the notch is. There's the notch. Um, am I looking at the right thing? Just one second. Yes, that's the notch. So there's like some leaf litter on there or something. <laughs> okay, so the next step is to put this trough in here and I don't know if you can see it well on the camera but 
basically you fill the different troughs to maintain humidity and it looks like I'm going to fill this trough that goes around here and then the slightly smaller trough in there and keep those full of water. I'm not going to do that right now for the sake of um, moving this for portability's sake. I'll put the water in a little later, but you, you put the water into those trays and then it looks like the next step is the thermostat. So I'll grab the thermostat here. Drop the, the microphone. So I accidentally stepped on the cord and tripped it, tripped myself up on that. So let me catch up to the chat just a little bit. So Charles asks, is this a DIY egg incubator? Nope, this is a hubabator. So it, it's uh, come like this. And so Captain Obvious, you keep all your invertebrates in communals. And I think they can work. I mean, I have the communal beetle and velvet ant set up, but I'm just saying this is my, my personal take on it. With those three very different creatures, I would hesitate to do it unless I'd seen someone else do it, but you might very well have success with it. Okay. Um, all right. So I bought this on Amazon. Oh, reptiles and fish short in the house as well. You could use fresh compost for this incubator. Well, yeah, that's a, a one way to provide heat. It's true. And Calconort, greetings. So let's see if we can put this part together. All right, so the next part actually goes on top. And here's the top. Put it back on for the moment. And um, okay. So it looks like, based on the instructions here, I need to take this uh, wing nut. The wing nut onto the adjusting screw is what I'm doing here. Something like that. Okay. And then thread adjusting screw assembly into slot until the nut, enough of the shaft is visible on the inside of the incubator to accept the wafer. So I'm going to put it either the slot is up here and I have to thread it through this way. All right. I don't know if you can see this very well. I'm trying to show you but the lighting is probably pretty crummy for that okay and then I'm going to thread the wafer here's the wafer I'm going to thread that in on the screw hmm. that's a little complicated hmm I can't see it very well. Huh. Oh, well, I got it on there. Spinning it around. I don't know how much of this you can see. Okay, until it stops. And then with incubator plugged in, turn adjusting screw counterclockwise until light comes on. Okay, so I got to plug it in. Hmm. Let's see how that goes. Probably going to just, well, of course, I'm going to unplug it again later, but just for demonstration purposes, I'll plug it in right now, right over here. Okay. And it looks like the light is already on. I don't know if you can see that, but the little, the little light is on. Okay. And keep turning counterclockwise as needed to reach desired temperature. So what I'm going to do is take the thermometer and, and hygrometer. And I'm just going to set it in there like that. Put that on carefully. And then we'll see where we get temperature-wise. Um, hopefully that does the job. So going to catch on with up with the chat and then we'll see where we go all right 
Well, the velvet the ones that have a really painful bite. They do have a very painful sting. Yep, and they are wingless wasps and have one of the most painful stings of some of the critters. Uh, many, there's one right there. Where's one of my velvet ants? Right there. There's a couple in here. I don't see the other one now. The other one's a lot more shy, a different species. Quite a bit smaller. I saw it a minute ago. Well, maybe half an hour ago. It's been a while. But they're feasting on carrots that my daughter just put in here. Um, so yeah, since we're on the topic of velvet ants, let's see. Let's see. So you don't sell rubber ducky isos on your site. I do not. I am not. Um, I haven't bred them yet. I have some, but I haven't bred them yet. And I also do not have a permit to sell them yet. So we'll see how it goes. And make it Kate. That is a good point. If the, since it's just made out of styrofoam, might have durability issues, but you could probably reuse a lot of the, the heating components on a small cooler. That's true. Very good point. Uh, let's see. Wow, Captain Obvious, that is an interesting idea. I don't know if anybody is hearing this. Oh, that's what's going on. Right here, this velvet ant, the other velvet ant that I mentioned, just got stomped on by the um, Eleotis beetle. And not that it hurt it at all, but um, looks like it got all sandy. And it was stridulating, which sounds like a little buzzing noise. And uh, you probably didn't pick it up on the microphone, but that's what was going on. I could hear it in the room. So that was, she's cleaning herself off there, getting rid of all that sand. This is my more shy velvet ant, but she does this little dance with her abdomen all the time. She's pretty cool. Um, so, so Captain Obvious, that is an interesting idea. It's pretty cool. The, uh, so the tarantula doesn't overeat or anything, huh? I don't know a lot about tarantula feeding. Picked them up a few times and not been stung, although when I was a child I was stung, but as an adult, I haven't picked them up really on purpose except when I'm capturing them. And I haven't been stung as an adult, but I did get stung as a child. Uh, let's see. So, prehistoric mat. I'm actually hatching blue death finning beetles, like the one in the center shot there, hiding in the rocks. That's what I'm going to be incubating, the, pu the pupae. They require pretty high temperatures. Temperatures of about 88 degrees to pupate, or at least in the 80s, and 88 seems to be kind of a magic number, so... And Heather Jensen, I'm about to purchase some glass at Lowe's to make a lid for a 5.5 gallon aquarium. Um, you can get it at Lowe's. I don't know if you have Lowe's for sure in your area or not, but uh, just the hardware store chain. They will cut glass for you. So you buy a piece bigger than what you want and have it cut. They'll cut it right there in the shop. And some Home Depots will do it and some won't, in my experience. So, where are the Velvet Ants native to? These two I caught just, well, no, one of these. This little one, this Dazimutilla vestita, I caught uh, just a short drive from my house. They, their velvet ants live all over the world pretty much, not in Antarctica, but there are about 8,000 species of velvet ant, and they live all over the world. And they're widely distributed in North America, they live in Africa, they live in Asia, they live in Australia, South America, they're all over the place. But uh, this, the larger one here that you see, that's Dazimutilla klugai. That one was sent to me by Bugs in Cyberspace, so I did not catch that one locally. And, okay. Rochant in the house, nice to see you here. Oh, somebody fell over. That is cool, Captain Obvious, I gotta say, I like that sound, the sound of that setup. So, Heather Jensen, 27 gallon cube in the standard glass that they saw as an area for filters, but I don't want peds and snails escaping. Ah, good idea. You can just get another piece cut. Okay, so Elaine Smith is hearing it like a constant buzz. You may be hearing filters, you may be hearing the incubator. I'm not sure what that is. But the ant was buzzing for sure. Uh, for a minute there. It was pretty cool. I, I love my velvet ants. Looks like she got her abdomen all. She got all the sand off her abdomen. Uh, but still has some on her thorax. So, velvet ants have pretty bad stings, yes. 
Um, they're not at all aggressive. I've been stung by other wasps that are really pretty aggressive. Velvet ants are not. They, they'll sting if they have to, but they're really not all that excited about stinging. They'd rather just run off. That's their first line of defense. If that doesn't work, they'll stridulate to scare off predators, potential predators. And then finally they will sting um, if they really, really have to, but they're not at all aggressive about it, I find. So I'm not too worried about it. And let's see. And there may be some velvet ants in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm not sure which species you got there but I would be really surprised if you didn't have any and let's see Randy Harmon can only members chat nope anybody can chat anybody who's in the in the uh, live stream can chat so Heather Jensen is anyone else fed bed as springtails my bed of fat Diana is having a field day with the springtails I don't know if I've ever tried springtails on bettas I fed them to fish before but I don't know if I've ever tried bettas but it makes sense because they love surface you know, food that stays on the surface, so that, that makes all kinds of sense. You're going to munch on a carrot there for us? Uh, let's see. You know if you can find velvet ants captive bread? I live in England, so they're not native. Uh, velvet ants are one of the few critters that I keep that cannot be captive bred, at least not yet, because their life cycle is so convoluted. They're parasites on other ground nesting, not flightless, but ground nesting wasps and bees. So they need to live inside the conditions of the hive of the ground nesting wasps and bees. And doing that in captivity is pretty prohibitive so far. So, unfortunate, but true. So, Wonder Pet Chronicles. Some of my superworms pupated and I've become so fond of the beetles. They're so cute in their own way. You know, I've been tempted. There was one of the subscribers, um, Dr. Spud, who was doing that, keeping them, the superworms, as pets. They're pretty comparable in size to these large Eleotis beetles, and even though they like a little more humidity and so on, their care is not too far off. So I could totally see that. Um, that sounds actually pretty fun. So Jordan, hey, welcome. I put, I answered your question verbally in the beginning of this video. So after the live stream is over, go check it out. Um, your question about the ABG mix and everything, I made sure to, to address that at the beginning of this video. So that's for you. And thank you for your question, Jordan. And let's see, Randy Harmon. I'm inquiring about scuds and blackworms being cultured together. Good question. Uh, I have cultured scuds and daphnia together. I've cultured scuds, daphnia, and detritus worms together. I've never done blackworms together with them. I've never cultured blackworms at all, in fact. But, uh, hmm. I wonder if that would work. I think it's worth a try. From what I've read, I've read on how to culture blackworms, so it might work. I'm wondering if the scuds would end up out competing the blackworms and eating a lot of the food, but I think it would be worth a try if you have access to both. Oh, and thank you, Pet Paradise. That is awesome. I'm glad you enjoy the channel so much. I enjoy making all these videos for everybody. I enjoy the live streams where we get to chat and just the whole business. It's, it's pretty fun. Prehistoric mat. Yeah, you'd probably need a pretty decent size environment to be able to provide what the ground nesting bees wanted. I mean, even my cousin, who is a professional entomologist who uh, specializes in bees and wasps, including velvet ants, he's tried to breed them and he has not been able to do it. So, pretty tricky. Um, so, Heather Jensen. Recently was looking for variety for my Pac-Man frog. The store sold me something called spikes and they look like little worms. When I did research, they are actually maggots. Yes! Blue bottle spikes are a pretty common food for a lot of critters. I have fed them to a, a variety of my critters, from mantids to jumping spiders to crested geckos to leopard gecko, um, probably other things. I think I fed one to my scorpion. I actually have a little video clip of that I should post at some point. Uh, but my wife said, no more blue bottle spikes. So uh, she wasn't too happy about those in the house, and I can't really blame her. So she said, okay, go ahead and feed them off and release, give whatever um, is left over to the chickens. Not release it, that didn't make sense. Give whatever is left over to the chickens so nothing can mature. And so that's what I did, and I understand. But I ended up 
uh, I think it's a lot harder to take care of certain creatures like jumping spiders, Phidippus jumping spiders, if you don't have ready access to blue bottle spikes. They're also great food for quite a few other creatures. And yes, uh, these beetles in Velvet Ants are really easy to take care of. You can see they love carrots. Well, the Velvet Ants will once in a while nibble on them, but they're not a real big fan. They, they all like the beetle jelly. They'll eat cat food. They'll eat all kinds of stuff. They're really pretty easy to take care of. I have a little nectar well back there, a little gravity feeder. Is it gravity? I don't know. It's a 3D printed little feeder that has sugar water that the Velvet Ants drink. And then the, the beetles... Are not so into that but they love the carrots i put cat food in here put the beetle jelly in and whatnot they just do great and i love the way the setup looks of course right now need to clean up some of the dried carrots uh, but other than that i think it looks pretty cool and they live a long time the velvet ants can live a couple years the beetles can live years and years some of them over a decade and me too we're getting a good number of viewers this time it used to be when we did uh, live streams on tuesdays we would get more viewers than we do on Wednesdays for whatever reason. But uh, it's, it, it was, looks like we're starting to catch up again. It's been a while since we've been doing it on Wednesdays, and I think it's just a harder day for people. But we're starting to get more viewers anyway, which I'm excited about. And I'm amazed I'm getting to see a lot of this Dazimutilla Vestita. She's usually not this bold, but it, they do go through a learning curve. I've noticed the velvet ants, when you first put them in the enclosure, they're really, really secretive for a few days. And then they start figuring things out and realizing you're not going to hurt them, I guess. And then they do their thing. And they're, they're out and about, really active, really fun. See, this, this big one, she's not afraid of anything. She just runs around all the time, which is cool. All right, let's see what we got. So, Bare Bottom Aquarium, Steenfutz. And, oh, awesome. Bob Steenfutz. He's got a really cool channel, and I'm glad that he, he pops into the live streams when he can. And I've sent him some isopods. He's, he's a cool guy. He's got some really cool things going, too. So if you haven't checked him out and you like anything related to aquariums, and he's got some reptiles and he's got isopods, check it out. And Wonder Pet Chronicles. I couldn't agree more. I love watching inverts just do their thing, whatever that thing is. And make it Kate. Yeah, it is like watching a fish tank. Um, just no water changes. Anyone else have the winter blues because you can't order inverts and in plants? I'm starting black mondo grass. It's something to do for now. Cool. I know what you mean. I've been looking forward to getting some new inverts. Of course, I've been working on my uh, permits. Today I spent probably close to two hours while I was on the bus working on permit stuff for isopods. And I nearly went blind just doing that. <laughs> but uh, I am approved for most of the isopods I keep to keep them. Turns out there's another step. You have to get the uh, you have to get the permits to have the isopods sent to you, but then you also have to get the permit to send the isopods out. And I, it's easier to get the permits for isopods that you keep to get sent to you rather than sending them to other people, interestingly enough. But uh, I am starting to get approves, approvals coming in for those. They're coming in faster, fortunately, than uh, they were for a while. So that's working. So Elaine, the Choya pieces I actually bought online. I collected the, um, the sagebrush, the weathered sagebrush pieces myself. Those I can get really close to home and they're all over the place. So I can get those. But the Choya pieces I can't get right around my house, and so I bought those on Amazon, actually. And make it, Kate, me too. Winter blues. Uh, I just don't like the winter much myself. I live in a place where the winter is way too long. Sometimes, you know, as make it, Kate lives pretty close to me, and we, uh, we get snow in November, not all that infrequently. And sometimes earlier, sometimes in October and whatnot. Usually not for very long or very deep, but we get it. And then in... Sometimes we even get snow in May. And occasionally, rarely, in June. Not much, and it never sticks. But uh, it's not uncommon to get snow into March or April. You know, that's, that's not uncommon. So it's a pretty long winter here. So... 
So yeah, I'm in the state of Utah where the winters are long. Unless you go down, some places in the south of the state are, are much better. The Washington County in the southwest corner of the state is more like a little slice of Arizona, weather-wise. And so it's, it's pretty cool. I like to go down there. Yeah, yeah, we can't plant most of the garden stuff like tomatoes until Mother's Day. That's usually the, how it works here. Okay, so Elaine, you can collect choya pieces but don't know how to treat it. I would say if you're reasonably certain that it's in an area where there aren't any pesticides, I just put it in the oven at 200 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes to an hour and call it good. That, that treatment regime works well for most wood that I, I use. And choya wood would be especially amenable to that because it is so porous. You don't have to worry about something hiding out deep in the core of it because the core of it is hollow and would get heated up very easily. Um, so, now, Heather's saying, I need suggestions. Forest floor terrarium, I want some item that would be comparable to something you would expect to see on the ground that someone dropped in nature and couldn't find. Hmm. Interesting. Like a, like a piece of jewelry or something? I think it would be kind of fun to see something like that, like a ring. That's the first thing that comes to my mind for some reason. I don't know. It's a kind of metal that wouldn't, you know, degrade in there. Like, but that'd be kind of expensive, probably something gold or something like that. But that would, I don't know. That seems cool to me. So Slav Pepe, apparently isopods help remove metals from groundwater. Hmm. Are those aquatic isopods? I know that isopods can sequester heavy metals in general. Just isopods in general can sequester heavy metals in there carapaces to help you know detoxify them uh, they will collect them that way and so it's not in their bloodstream and so on so so you imagine if serpa design made vivarium for a goody sapphire ornamental that would be beautiful those are some beautiful spiders I'll tell you that so that would be really cool so pet paradise three Species of velvet ants in Pennsylvania. Awesome. Hopefully you're able to, to find some. Pocket watch could work too. That'd be cool, actually, especially if it were running still. How do I clean up animal skulls so they're safe for my lizards? If they're just, you know, they've been treated with dermestids already or whatever so that there's no flesh left on them, I would probably bake them at a low temperature again, like 200 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Nokia phone in the, in the terrarium. That'd be cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, taking fire ants, um, any kind of creature really, from one place to another, smuggling is very dangerous for the environment, but also for you, potentially. Okay, so... Yeah, especially since fire ants are very invasive. That's a scary thing. So, Slav Pepe, the article I read just talked about terrestrial isopods. Not sure about aquatic ones. Okay. Cool. That is really cool. I love just watching these guys nibble on the carrots. It's kind of fun. And then they, they attack each other. They're not really hurting each other. I think this is uh, some sort of either courtship behavior or something going on. I don't think I have a mating pair, though. Yes, fire ants. I, I had some experience with fire ants in Texas where they have been introduced unfortunately and they just they would they crawl up your leg before you even knew you were there and sting you all over it was not fun okay rodent skulls you don't have any diseases yeah that's what I would do probably is um, if they've already they don't have any flesh on them I would just cook them in the oven at 200 degrees for half an hour to an hour or something like that probably be good All right. Well, cool. Uh, the time has really flown. Oh, I can understand. Make it Kate, yes. They, my sisters, when we went to Texas when I was a kid, they did not want to brave the, uh, the fields with us. My brother and I, we really wanted to go out and see the critters, and they were like, no, not with fire ants. We're not going to do it. So they just stayed very close to the house most of the time. My brother and I got stung multiple times, but we, uh, 
enjoyed seeing all the turtles and fish and frogs and whatnot that live there. So it was worth a few stings to us. Well, it is now uh, six o'clock and I need to go make more videos and I need to move this incubator off the floor and put it somewhere else. But uh, I hope you all enjoyed the little peek into my vivarium again. Maybe you already saw the, the beetle video I recently made. But it's, it's always just fun to take a look at these guys when they're all active. And I hope you enjoyed the setup of the incubator. Pretty soon I'll be putting some larvae in there. So thanks for everyone. Thanks for the stream. And I will catch you soon.